Hello, thank you so much for joining us. I'm very excited to be here with Robert Riley, also called Bob. Um, Robert is the director of the Westminster Institute here in DC, but today he's here to talk about his newest book, America on Trial, A Defense of the Founding. Now you can learn more about Robert's esteemed career and his previous publications by reading the video description below. And I also encourage you, if you're not already, to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to visit our website at CICDC.org to learn more about our other upcoming events and to subscribe to our newsletter. On that note, I now give the screen to Robert. Rosemary, thank you very much. It's, it's wonderful to uh, talk to CIC. Uh, however, I so wish I could be there and we could be together there as uh, soon, I hope. In any case, I greatly appreciate this opportunity to talk today about the theme of my book, America on Trial, A Defense of the Founding. I think it's pretty clear to everyone that America is on trial. It's, it's assailed from all sides. Uh, we saw it during last summer in the riots, uh, the tearing down of the statues of some of the founders of the United States. Um, and the general denigration of America uh, in the 1619 project from the New York Times that were really about slavery. Uh, these charges aren't really new. Uh, there are charges, however, that come not just from the radical left, but from the conservative right, indeed the Christian right, and, and from some Catholics. Uh, that charge is slightly different in that it says that America was contaminated at its founding. It was given a timed release poison pill based on a notion of the radical individualism of man. And as Christian faith began to recede in this country, one could see the impact of this principle of the radical individualism come to the fore, as it has in various Supreme Court decisions, especially from Justice Anthony Kennedy, that we all get to make up our meaning of the universe. And uh, that included uh, the right to homosexual relations, the right to homosexual marriage, and now transgenderism. So there seems no end, no natural end, of course, to what uh, one can assume uh, it is one's right to do. And these critics, such as uh, Patrick Deneen and Michael Hanby, uh, give a very acute and accurate diagnosis of this current disorder under which we're living and uh, the nature of the, the near moral collapse from which we're suffering. I agree completely with their diagnosis. What I dispute is their statement that we can find the origin of this malevolence in the founding itself, uh, that it was implanted there, though it is now, you know, 240 years later, manifesting itself in a particularly virulent form. Now, my book, my book disputes this thesis, uh, though the major part of the book isn't about it. I ask myself the question, from where did the ideas that made the American founding possible come from? What is their intellectual provenance? How did it occur to man that he should rule himself through his reason? So I began a hunt for the lineage of those notions that made the American founding possible. Now, the the thesis from Patrick Deneen and others is that we don't really need to go back much further than the Enlightenment to find the source of those ideas, uh, as that's where they came from, from John Locke, from Thomas Hobbes, etc. Uh, I, I found that not to be the case, and it took me actually back uh, 
to uh, pre-philosophic Greece, back to ancient Israel, and of course to Christian revelation. So I'm just briefly going to touch upon what were those seminal contributions uh, from those three sources that made something like the American founding possible. Well, philosophy referred to as the gift of the, the Greeks by Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, was a radical change in humankind. A uh, man before philosophy had a tribal outlook on existence that was confined by the outlines of that tribe, how it was constituted in the relation in tribal relations. Uh, and by the head of the tribe or the head of the polis, who usually had some divine or semi-divine connection with the gods uh, that invested him with the right to rule. Man's access within that tribe to the gods was only through that ruler. There was no individual access. Uh, one really existed only as a member of a tribe and couldn't conceive himself outside of it. Now, what this meant in relation to other tribes is it was usually one of, of hostility. In fact, often you would find in the languages of these tribes, the, the term foreigner also meant enemy. And the relation was usually one of, well, could have been most often war. Uh, to subdue the other tribe or prevent oneself from being subdued. The typical outcome of these conflicts was the victor would uh, slaughter all the males and enslave the women and the children. What's interesting is that neither side in this conflict could conceive of a moral objection to this behavior uh, because the defeated uh, tribe would have engaged in exactly the same uh, behavior had it won. So there was, there was nothing in their moral universe uh, was such that it could raise an objection to this. The reason for this is that they didn't have the means by which to recognize a member of another tribe as a human being. The notion of a human being was foreign to tribal life. It wasn't in their vocabulary. And that's why they couldn't conceive of any of these actions as a moral problem. Now that came about only through the gift of the Greeks, reason and philosophy that made this great discovery of nature and of natural law. <clears throat> Let me briefly sketch this out. <clears throat> the Greeks noticed, the pre-Socratic philosophers noticed that there is a certain order in nature and that man has this ability through his reason to apprehend this order so that the universe operates by rational principles. How could that be? How is it that man could apprehend this order and come to understand it? Well, in the first known use of the word Heraclitus said there must be a divine intelligence behind the world, and that this divine intelligence is the source of this rational order in it, and indeed the source of our own rational abilities to apprehend it. And for the first time, he called this divine intelligence logos, which as you know in Greek means reason or word. And all things had their origin in this logos and man's duty was to conform himself to it, to live according to logos. Now, Aristotle refined this notion of natural law with his conception of essences, that man, indeed all things have a nature a given nature. Man does not make himself to be man. He is man as constituted by his nature, which, which means he can't be a giraffe or a geranium. And we know uh, by his nature what it is that 
contributes to the perfection or fulfillment of that nature so that man becomes most himself as a man. Now, it, let's give it just a tiny example in another way. Let's say uh, the acorn. The acorn has the nature of an oak tree. Now, nowhere along the trajectory of the growth of that acorn into the oak tree will it become something other than an oak tree. It reaches its perfection in a fully mature oak tree. How does it get there? Well, uh, it, it relies on other things such as the proper soil. Um, it needs moisture. Uh, these things are good for the oak tree. Overly acidic soil and a drought, those are bad for the oak tree. Why? Because it inhibits the, the oak tree from reaching the fulfillment of its nature. Those are bad things. And the moisture and its right balance in the soil are good things. Those, those are how good and bad are defined. Now, when we come to man, says Aristotle, we have a slightly different situation because only man can choose or frustrate the fulfillment of his nature as a man. Now, what is the end of man? What, what is his perfection? What is that constituted by? Aristotle says clearly, as did almost everyone who followed him, later philosophers, that the end of man is happiness. How does he reach this happiness? Through a life of virtue. Now, what is the contribution his reason makes? Aristotle uh, points out that re reason is the highest faculty in man. And the end of reason, uh, which constitutes this happiness is the contemplation of the divine, the contemplation of that which is highest. Now, anything which inhibits man's development to reach that end is bad for him. And those things that contribute to it are good for him. We can be more specific since we know man is not only rational, but possesses free will. So that we can we can say those bad things are evil and the the other things are are good. So we we develop a moral vocabulary from our apprehension of essence of nature, particularly with men, who is a moral creature, a rational creature, par excellence, says Aristotle. <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> nature now gives man the means by which the apprehension of nature the means by which to recognize someone from another tribe as a human being. That it's not his tribe that constitutes him. He's not constituted by his tribe, but by nature, by the laws of nature. You know, this leads later uh, to Cicero in Rome, who was a great exponent of natural law. And by the way, who had a great influence on the founders of the United States because of the power of his natural law thinking. You would say there's not one, there's not one nature or law in Rome and another in Athens. They're the same. These laws of nature are, are everywhere and they are immutable. And so it was uh, that man came uh, to, to this deeper understanding of the nature of reality. <clears throat> Other philosophers, such as Plato, reinforced this notion of the universe when he said it was the product of mind. In other words, this logos thought the world. It's the product of thought. And one can think about the product of thought. And by one's thinking, one can come to some understanding of the originator of these things, which led Aristotle to define God as thought thinking itself and the, the final end of man to, to imitate uh, this divine being as closely as one could because one has within oneself this divine spark. Okay, now in the ancient world, another astonishing contribution was made by <clears throat> 
Jerusalem in a sea of polytheism in the Middle East. This one tribe, the Israelites, believed in a revelation of one God, Yahweh. Now, the, the extraordinary thing about Yahweh was not only that he was one, but that he was transcendent. One must understand in the ancient world, the idea of these gods and spirits, uh, they, were, they were all imminent. There was, there was nothing above the universe. It was a self-enclosed entity that had existed eternally. Now, the gods inhabited the imperium. They were up in some uh, sphere above man, but it was still within the world. So this was a unique notion that there was one God, uh, that he was transcendent. And also that creation was constituted ex nihilo. The ancient world believed that the world was eternal. It, it, const it always existed. Judaism said, no, uh, God created from nothing. All of a sudden, uh, this endless procession of an eternal universe is broken. And for the first time, we can speak of such a thing as history. Uh, monotheism breaks through that world of, monothe of this, through polytheism uh, with this notion that uh, the universe has a beginning and indeed it will have an end and that we exist somewhere along in this linear progression of time. Time is no longer a loop, a circle. Uh, so it has a beginning and we're headed toward the end. Now, the other unique contribution from Judaism was uh, in Genesis, in creation, but first of all, this, this act of creation by Yahweh was by, through his word and that he, he spoke and loved creation into being. In all the other ancient mythologies in the Middle East, creation such as it was, even though matter was eternal, uh, was an act of violence. It, it resulted from one emi, demiurge defeating another demiurge in, in a battle. The principle of light defeats the principle of darkness and so forth. Um, the principle of good overthrows at least temporarily the principle of evil or the demiurge of evil. Such was not the case in, in Judaism. God, God alone creates the world. And since there is no principle of evil, everything he makes is good, is the famous refrain from the, the six days of creation, and God saw that it was good. It was all good. And what was particularly good was this creation of man, uh, which again, uniquely in, in the revelation uh, or mythologies of the Middle East, uh, man is constituted in the Imago Dei. Man is made in the image and likeness of God. This was extraordinary because it endowed man with a, an inviolability, a sacredness in his being, since he's in the very image of his creator, which is constituted by his free will, by his reason. Um, and, and by his own immortality and his destiny in this God, this one God. Now, Israel was a tribe now with a universal God. There was only one God, Yahweh. Uh, however, it continued as a tribal religion. The Jews did not proselytize, as you know. Uh, but extraordinarily, they preserved this unique revelation. Now, now comes Christianity, which, of course, uh, began in Judaism as Christ was a Jew. Now, what, what is revealed in Christianity is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, the achievement of man's salvation, and the additional revelation 
that so enhances the, the status of man that each individual person is the object of infinite love by this God. That God indeed is love. He is not only reason. He is not only logos. He is love. So the standard by which one person ought to treat another uh, is elevated to an even higher degree. By the way, through Judaism, through Genesis and Christian revelation, we can find the origin of almost every conception of human rights. And even those who are not Christians or Jews who insist on this kind of respect and the existence of human rights uh, are, are beneficiaries of Genesis and Christianity nonetheless. Now, one can imagine in the ancient world at the time of Christ, which was basically a Hellenic world, it was Greek speaking and it was dominated by, by the Greeks. Uh, the electrifying effect of the beginning of the Gospel of St. John, when he says in the beginning was the word, the gospel of course is in Greek. And what he, he what, so let, let's just keep the one, one Greek word. In the beginning was the logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God, and all things are made through him as Logos. So here we have a confirmation of the fact that God himself is reason. So now we find out why there is a rational order in the universe and why doing what is reasonable is uh, the standard of moral conduct. In fact, Thomas Aquinas, so much later in the 13th century, said the character of sin is its irrationality. So Christianity confirms the authority of reason to uh, its, its status as revelatory of the moral law which man can reach through his reason, but now also is confirmed through divine revelation um, and the higher standard of, of God, not only as reason, but of love and the obligation to love. One can imagine Heraclitus, after having contemplated the origin of uh, the rational origin of the universe as Logos, met Logos walking through the door. This was the impact of Christian revelation and of Christ on this Hellenic world. And St. John's gospel uh, is really directed to the Greeks and uses a vocabulary that makes what happened in the incarnation comprehensible to them. So as Benedict the 16th says that Greek philosophy preceded uh, Christian revelation was not an historical accident. It was providential. So profound was the impact of this that it became the source of a new civilization. And I'm going to jump quickly uh, forward in order that we can get to the American founding before I run out of time to see how uh, the impact of these Greek, uh, Greek philosophy, Jewish monotheism, and Christian revelation uh, were instantiated or reflected in a political order, which is what happened in the Middle Ages. Now, how it happened is one of the most intriguing stories because it received its first articulation in the church's canon law. This was actually a, a very surprising discovery for me in the research of writing this book that it should be so, that it was canon law that first articulated the uh, 
constitutional principles. Now, canon law was changed through the discovery of the Just Justinian Code and an examination of certain legal principles that were in it. Here is one of the most interesting. Quod omnes tangit ab omnibus approbari. What, what affects all must be approved by all. Now, the application of this ancient Roman principle was in private law and it only, uh, uh, it only concerned, uh, say, the, um, those who were overseeing a minor or uh, it, it, it just was like uh, the, the agreement of the members of a board to what uh, the, the organization was doing, not the organization, it was private law. It concerned only individuals. It had no larger political application. Now, what the canonists did was expand the meaning of this principle. And they did so within the structure of the first corporations that ever existed, which were church corporations uh, within dioceses, within religious orders, within church councils. How were they to conduct themselves? Well, as this uh, principle, this quote omnes principle, uh, sort of permeated itself or, or through these church corporations, it meant that uh, what what they did, uh, whatever they undertook that affected its members, had to be approved by its members. Often, this involved financial matters. And in that respect, this was an early uh, premonition of no taxation without representation. I'll give you just a small example. In the Dominican order, uh, they would have a conclave. And so members of the various uh, Dominican abbeys would have to send representatives to this conclave. So the first thing was the selection of these representatives who were empowered to represent uh, those members of the order at that abbey. And when they went to the conclave, the conclave together through a majority vote could approve or disapprove whatever matters came before it. And it was binding on everyone, including on St. Dominic. So this, this conclave, this representative a body uh, exercised sovereignty. And it was St. Dominic's uh, success of the same thing was uh, observed. It became the Dominican rule. Now the Dominicans went to England and were uh, practicing or uh, operating accord according to the same principles of uh, representation and consent. And it was often the case that members of religious orders or clerics uh, were dual-headed. They served both ecclesiastical function, but also a secular function. They were, uh, they had uh, positions in the royal courts and so forth. And what you saw was um, the a leeching of this influence from the the spiritual to the secular order, and the early uh, formations of parliaments began operating by these same principles. Um, that there would be elected representatives, there would be a parliament at which certain matters would be placed and it required a majority vote to approve those matters. And uh, well, how large a majority? Well, again, this was, this was a matter that uh, was settled within the church, church councils, and indeed in the election of the popes, it required a two thirds majority. So it's stunning to see within the medieval world uh, all of the constitutional principles developed uh, and practiced within the church and then starting in the secular realm. And we find that uh, these, these are the principles. Popular sovereignty uh, based upon the equality of all people. In the political realm, this meant that 
uh, God, all, all authority comes from God, but God does not directly invest that authority into the king or the ruler. It's in the people. And therefore, the people's consent is required for the constitution of that um, uh, government. Uh, whether it's a king or some other form of government, it receives its legitimacy through the consent of the people. Now, how is that co consent expressed? Again, they're through a right of representation. Uh, and, and therefore, obviously, a right to vote. Now, once this authority is invested in the king or in a parliament, uh, if it exercises that power or authority in contradiction to the covenant or agreement by which that it originally received the authority, the people have a right to revolution, to change the king or overthrow the parliament. This was generally agreed throughout the Middle Ages, the right to revolution. So the equality of all people of the requirement of consent, the right to representation, and the right to revolution if there is a gross abuse of this authority. Um, I should also and should have mentioned earlier, the, excuse me a second, the matter of uh, the two swords teaching, which was articulated in the uh, late fifth century by Gelasius, that the spiritual authority is one sword and the civic or government authority is the second sword. And that man lives uh, under this dual sovereignty. And it became the case in the constitutional developments about which I just spoke, that because of this dual sovereignty, um, not neither of these sovereignties could claim absolute control because there was another sovereignty that also uh, exercised its powers. So you saw in the Middle Ages um, protected struggles uh, in defining what was the line between the ecclesiastical and the secular authority. But it became generally settled that uh, the, the Pope and the church would confine itself to spiritual matters and, and the king uh, would confine himself to those secular matters uh, that led to some tranquility of order within which man could pursue his his higher destiny, which was uh, his salvation and, and life in Christ. Uh, you see, because of this uh, dual sovereignty, uh, limits were placed. There was no such thing in the Middle Ages as the divine right of kings or the notion of an absolute sovereignty uh, that could be expressed in any secular order. This is a kind of an overthrow of, let's say, the popular image of the Middle Ages uh, that uh, the princes or the kings exercised absolute power. No, that notion was completely foreign to the Middle Ages, uh, and it developed later, and now we're going to move quickly through that. Why, one would think, uh, didn't we, since all of those constitutional principles were articulated and practiced to some extent, better or worse, in the Middle Ages, why wasn't there a direct line from the Middle Ages to the American founding? And the reason was that late in the Middle Ages, another notion uh, arose that is, I think, perhaps the very key thing uh, that I should emphasize uh, in this lecture. Everything turns on the relationship uh, uh, or whether uh, we have the primacy of reason or the primacy of will. This was a deep theological discussion, uh, which was made clear by Thomas Aquinas. I'm just going to briefly read this so that we get through it quickly and I, I make it as clear as possible. The Thomas teaching that God's will proceeds from his divine intellect and not the other way around. This is the core issue of that time and of our time. 
Aquinas argued that since God is logos or reason itself, his will follows upon intellect. Reason rules, will follows. The word precedes action. You know, God spoke. Let there be light and there was light. The primacy of intellect is clear. The intellect directs the will. The will then acts in accord with reason. That was the consensus. That was the theological core of this order that I described to you in medieval Christendom. Now, William of Ockham, late in the Middle Ages, overthrew this understanding and flipped the relationship. God's will now becomes primary and his intellect subordinate to it as a mere instrument. This changes everything. It is no longer God's knowledge that constitutes being. It is his will that does so. Will becomes the ontological principle, not reason, not logos. So let's be clear, either reason rules and will follows, or will rules and reason follows. In the latter case, reason simply becomes a tool for the will to use in however it wishes to accomplish what it wills. What's more, it's impossible intelligibly to distinguish among instances of will on the basis of will alone. In other words, Will is presupposed to nothing but itself. Therefore, one can't distinguish between one act of the will and another by some standard outside of the will because it is will that has this primacy. Now, the, this was a, the overthrow of the medieval consensus a radical change in the understanding of God, which had consequences for everything. What it does is rob the universe of its intelligibility. In other words, will constitutes reality as the ontological principle, not logos. And since we can't distinguish between one instance of the will and the other, there's really no way to, to understand it. It's no longer a rational operation. So Occam, dis, Occam denied that things have essences. He denied that they have natures. They just exist individually as a direct uh, consequence of a separate act of God's will. And there's no connection between one act of God's will and another. So the intelligibility uh, collapses. Uh, there's no order in nature because there's no nature. We can't come to know it. There are no laws of nature and of nature's God. There is only there are only there's only God's omnipotence and God can do whatever he will. And because uh, nature is no longer intelligible, we can't through our reason come to know the difference between right and wrong. We can only know that through uh, revelation, what God tells us. And God can change his mind. And in one infamous remark, uh, Occam says God could order us to, to hate him, and we, we would have to do that. We couldn't gain say that. We could, he could order us to lie, and that, that would become the new standard of morality. Now, the, Occam's uh, influence was, was tremendous and had a great influence on Martin Luther, who adopted this, what we call nominalist view, nominalist and voluntarist view. The nominalist view is that there's no relationship between uh, words and reality. It's just what we choose to call things. But w things we can't, through naming, come to know them. They're just labels we make up. Uh, so he's an anomalous and he's a voluntarist, meaning God is pure will and power. Uh, his intellect is just instrumental to his will. It finds out the best way to do whatever he wills. Um, that means voluntarism, voluntas, God, will. God is just this will. And therefore, it becomes incomprehensible, right? 
there's no way to understand him because he's no longer logos. And this breaks the connection between man's mind and the divine intellect. And of course, it, it severs man's mind from the universe, which is no longer intelligible to him. Um, Luther was also a nominalist and a voluntarist directly under the influence of Occam. And th this is what led him to his uh, famous uh, statement of sola scriptura. Uh, while we have his scripture, uh, reason, as he said, is the devil's whore and so forth. Now, the political consequences of this view <clears throat> were the following. Uh, Luther did not believe in the equality of all people. You know, once you remove such a thing as nature or essences, how could you contend that all people are equal? Uh, we don't, we no longer really know what people are. It's just a name we, we made up. Uh, so there's no such thing as popular sovereignty. And since there's no longer popular sovereignty, uh, the ruler is no longer required uh, to get the consent of the people. How does the ruler receive his authority? Well, he gets it directly from God. And uh, he is only accountable to God. Uh, he rules as he wills. Uh, he, the ruler becomes really a reflection of the primacy of will in God. Uh, so we have the primacy of will in the ruler, not reason. So he's no longer obligated to do what is reasonable or in law is no longer a reflection of reason. Reason is no longer obligatory. Law becomes the will of the ruler and the ruler is not subject to the laws he wills. You see the development here of the divine right of kings and of absolutism in the government. Now, you won't be surprised to hear that <clears throat> Luther de uh, denying popular sovereignty or the right to representation uh, also denied the right to revolution. Later, he changed his mind in a qualified way, but he's pretty emphatic. There's no right to revolution. There's nothing that the ruler can do that would justify such a thing, His since his authority is directly from God and his power is absolute. No right to revolution. Now, Luther also destroyed the, the two swords in the sense that he destroyed the institutional structure of the church. He destroyed all the ecclesiastical corporations. He dissolved all the abbey, abbeys uh, and convents. He burnt the canon law in front of the church in Wittenberg. So that ecclesiastical sword that organization of the church that hemmed in the secular power was gone. There was now only one sword, and that was the, the, the sword held by the prince or the king. He now became the head of the church. That was part of the exercise of his absolute power. So we see the in this uh, really the destruction of Christendom. And the beginning of this idea of absolute uh, power in the secular sphere, because it's taken over the spiritual sphere. Now I move, boy, I should have moved a little more quickly here. We see a further development in the articulation of the divine right of kings in James the First in England and in Robert Filmer, his principal uh, defender in a book called Patriarcha. And uh, everything I said was uh, expressed by James I in rather radical means. Uh, the relationship between the subjects and the ruler is the same relationship as between a child and his father. Uh, he basically has no rights and uh, the king, uh, the king's right to rule and the powers he exercises are unrestricted. And of course, there's no right to revolution. Now, the principal opponents, the most powerful opponents to the divine right of kings, 
were Catholic clerics, specifically Cardinal Robert Bellarmine in Italy and the Jesuit Francisco Suarez in Spain. They used uh, and rearticulated natural law and the medieval constitutional principles that we've gone over earlier to challenge James I and Robert Filmer in their claims. They were generally recognized by everyone as the most powerful opponents to this. So incensed was James I with Robert Bellarmine that he engaged him uh, publicly in, in uh, uh, dueling monographs. It was very unusual for a, a royal, a ruling monarch to address a commoner in this way, but he knew he had to do something because of the power of Cardinal Bellarmine's arguments. He was so incensed by Francisco Suarez's writings that he had them burnt by a, his public executioner in London. So th this would be another surprise for many readers that it was it was the church that was the opponent of it, that articulated most powerfully the tradition of natural law and the constitutional principles against the divine right of kings. Now quickly, there was also within uh, the early Anglican uh, de denomination also an articulation of these things through Richard Hooker in his Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity. I, I say he basically saved uh, Protestantism from itself, at least in England, by reintroducing uh, both the thought of Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas. He was a strong proponent of natural law and also uh, therefore of these constitutional principles of popular sovereignty, the requirement of consent. So that was preserved to an extent in England through the power of Richard Hooker's thinking. The other opponents to divine right of kings that arose in England, I'm just going to mention one other, Algernon Sidney, uh, in his Discourses on Government, another powerful natural law thinker. He was an Anglican. He uh, used the thinking of Richard Hooker, but he also used Robert Bellarmine's thinking. He had to admit, you know, this is the, the strongest opponent. And uh, though he says that Bellarmine is expressing the common sense of mankind, uh, which is fine. That's what Bellarmine himself said he was doing. So all of these influences uh, came together and had quite an impact on John Locke, uh, who was wrote perhaps the most devastating critique against the divine right of kings uh, in uh, the first of his two discourses and uh, who, who also had a huge impact, uh, Hooker had a huge impact on Locke. Locke obviously had a large impact on the American Revolution. Hooker, by the way, also had an impact in the sense that uh, the Anglican church was so large in the American colonies and Hooker is the principal and greatest theologian uh, was what was taught and his laws of ecclesiastical polity were everywhere. And Algernon Sidney became a hero of the uh, colonial Americans uh, as a martyr to republicanism and his discourses on government. This powerful natural law document had a huge influence on the, on the founding such that at the time of the founding, uh, Hampton Sidney, uh, college in Virginia was created after honoring Sydney. Jefferson mentioned Sydney's discourses on government as one of the premier uh, books that ought to be taught to all the youth in the young United States because he was such a powerful exponent. Now, I want to also quickly mention that uh, a Filmer's book, Patriarcha, was also around in the colonies. Jefferson had a copy. Filmer understood that to defend the divine right of kings, he had to wrestle with Bellarmine and Suarez. And so he does extensive citations from Bellarmine. 
and he does so from uh, Suarez too, but to a lesser extent. So Jefferson had this book in his library, and it's it's uh, you, you, he he has uh, some underlinings in it. So we know that Jefferson knew uh, the thinking of Bellarmine and Suarez to a certain extent, as did other colonial Americans. Now, um, all of this thinking uh, was the foundation for the American Revolution in that uh, they, the colonies objected to being ruled without their consent. And unless the British Parliament was willing to find a way in which to obtain that consent, the colonials were going to to revolt reluctantly, but they were going to revolt because they were being made subject to absolute power. The British Parliament claimed it had absolute power over them, uh, thus the American Revolution. So the case I make is the American Revolution was a restoration of the primacy of reason against the primacy of will. It was a restoration of the medieval uh, political uh, constitutional principles. And that is the major case I make, and I try to uh, demonstrate it through the words of the founders themselves. Uh, and you, you will find them in particularly powerfully put forth in, in someone like uh, Wilson, who had such an influence in the constitutional debates, who signed both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, who was perhaps the most uh, traditional natural law thinking amongst the founders. And he, of course, was quoting Cicero. He was quoting Hooker. Um, and we have to be aware of, of these sources of influence to rightly understand the American founding and, and why uh, it, it, it was limited, why they were so concerned with limited government. Uh, to confine government to that secular sphere. Uh, so government could not abrogate upon itself absolute powers or consider itself uh, the source of man's salvation. As we know, the, the Christian, uh, the founders were overwhelmingly Christian and they understood that that source of their salvation uh, was in their uh, direct relationship with God through Christ. And they didn't look to government uh, for the source of that. However, they did understand with complete unanimity that the form of government they chose as a republic required, most of all, a citizenry that was virtuous. And was a, if the citizenry lost virtue, uh, the republic could not be sustained. George Washington in his first inaugural address said there's an indissoluble union between virtue and happiness. You couldn't imagine a more Aristotelian formulation. Now, uh, the founders also understood, again, unanimously, that the primary source for the formation of virtue in the American citizens uh, was the church. And they looked at the church for the cultivation of that virtue without which that republic could not last. Now, those principles of the American founding we find articulated in the Declaration of Independence so clearly put forth uh, and based upon the laws of nature and of nature's God uh, they claim that these, these inherent rights so to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness abide in man uh, because uh, God is their source. And the claim they make is to a universal truth. In other words, true everywhere at all times for everyone. And that is the foundation upon which they placed the origin of the American Republic. So I do not think it is to the founders or to the principles they espouse that we can look 
uh, for a poison pill with a time release formula that has brought us to the uh, state of moral corruption in which our country exists today. We have to look elsewhere for that. In fact, I think that our recovery cannot take place without a rearticulation and embrace of those founding principles and a recovery of the virtue uh, which they demand for their exercise. Uh, so the founding is not our enemy. Uh, the source of the evil which we're experiencing is not in that founding. It had no notion of radical individualism, uh, which we can hold responsible for transgenderism and these other disorders. Now, at the end of the book, I have an epilogue in which I do provide a sketch of what I think uh, the, the sources of that, how, how those sources of degeneration entered this country and had such influence that it has brought us uh, to the state in which we are today. And they weren't, they weren't from the American founding. That, well, that's my case. I, I, I know I've over, gone over in my time. So I will thank you for your patience and, and uh, take any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Bob. You know, while you're, while you're talking, the Socrates quote came into my head. You know, the unexamined life is not worth living. Um, and I think so many of us walk through life with a very superficial understanding of these, you know, complex issues, um, including like the virtues and the principles of our founding. And so first I just wanna say thank you for taking the time to write such a well-sourced and research book, research book. And I encourage anyone at home you know, take the time, like you listen to this lecture for an hour and there's so much information to, to process and to download, but you need to pick up the book so you can have a more full, have a fuller picture of what it is Bob is talking about. And this is one of the reasons why we have, you know, these intellectual events at the CIC, you know, we want people to be able to understand these complex ideas at a, on a real, you know, higher intellectual level. And it takes, you know, reading books and journals and um, and not reading, you know, one line memes on social media or just like your Facebook posts from your friend. You know, you really need to dig deep um, and take the time to learn. Um, so thank you, uh, Bob, for writing this book. Um, you know, I want to encourage again everyone watching, you know, sign up for our newsletter um, at our website at CICDC.org so you can stay up to date on all of our upcoming events. And, and Bob, I want to give you the final word here. Um, you know, we had a question that I think is going to leave us on a good note. You know, you talk about, you know, this is, you know, where we, where we started and, and kind of how it was twisted and, and, and kind of where we're at now. But what can the average person, like after they read your book, what's the next step they should take in order to combat these um, assumptions that seem to be really popular um, in our culture? Uh, you know, what, what can they do at home? What type of curriculum can they advocate for in their children's schools? Um, what type of conversations or petitions or anything should they be doing at home? Um, do you have any advice on that? And, and, you know, and after that, you can have the final word. I would suggest, of course, as you say, after reading my book, that um, you acquaint yourself with the 1776 commission. Uh, the president of Hillsdale College, Larry Arn, was the chairman of this commission, and it was instituted under the last administration precisely to provide a, a, a resource for people to understand the American founding better and its, and its principles. So you can still find the 1776 commission somewhere online, though one of the first executive orders of our new president was to abolish this commission because he has a different notion of, uh, I suppose, the legitimacy of the American founding. Um, so there are, there are many fine books and resources. There are the, the writings of the founders themselves um, to which I think uh, you ought to turn about George Washington, especially about John Adams, James Wilson, <clears throat> excuse me, but I, I, many books that can give you a general overview so you, you know how to drill down deeper. 
But again, I want to particularly make the case that the struggle here is between the primacy of reason and the primacy of will. The American founding was based on the primacy of reason, the appeal to reason. Let us reason together. The disorder from which we're suffering today is based on the primacy of will. The whole self-identity nonsense uh, that is taking place today is based on the primacy of will, that reality is constituted by will, not by logos. Therefore, we can make of, of ourselves whatever we wish and have the power to do, which leads to the absurdity of someone having themselves surgically mutilated uh, to pretend they, they are a person of a different sex. Uh, this, this, is, um, this is it's such a, a, a logical and radical expression. The self-affirmation is based upon this primacy of will. And as we can see, it, it leads to destruction. It leads to individual destruction. And unless we recover ourselves, it will lead to the destruction of the Republic. So we have to know what it's about. You know, I think since this is the CIC and the CIC is such an invaluable resource in the heart of Washington uh, with daily mass, confessions, the wonderful library that Kevin has overseen for so many years. Uh, are there, you know, I had the privilege of working for President Ronald Reagan. And I recall his saying, there, there is no recovery. There can be no recovery without a spiritual recovery. So the first thing we need is a recovery of faith. And we have to understand our own faith is a gift, not only to ourselves, but to others. And that the traditions of this faith, so deeply seeped in natural law and in the integrity of reason, in, in the existence of, of essences and, and nature and of man's nature and the good, the final good towards which it is directed. Although that was a, a general understanding at the time of the founding, we know it's been lost, but it is preserved in the Catholic Church. And therefore, we, we can make a great contribution by reacquainting people with these truths, not only with the truths of our faith, but the philosophical truths um, that can be given to anyone, uh, regardless of their faith, uh, because reason can apprehend the nature of reality. Uh, uh, that's because that reality itself is, is the expression of a divine intellect, a logos. Um, the, this is the this is the foundation. This is such a firm foundation on which we can set forth. And people are so hungry for the truth. They know deep in their souls, in their hearts, that what we're seeing taking place today is profoundly wrong, is profoundly immoral. They don't know how quite to articulate it, and they don't want to be canceled. But we have an obligation to tell the truth, and it can be told in a way that still has appeal. I have found that the American founding still has resonance. It can still be used to stir people's hearts and minds. You can't do that unless you're, you're not acquainted with the founding, and, and particularly with the, the lineage of the ideas that made the founding possible. And as you will discover in my book, those those are pre-enlightenment principles, and they are profoundly Catholic principles. Uh, but they apply to everyone simply because they're true. <laughs> so I don't know if that's enough of a peroration. No, that's great. Thank you again so much. Um, and everyone, thank you again for attending. Stay tuned for our other upcoming events, and have a wonderful day, and God bless.